welcome to building a continuous delivery pipeline with Gradle and Jenkins. What this is going to be is a high level overview of how you can construct a continuous delivery pipeline using uh, Gradle and Jenkins. Uh, this, this particular uh, presentation is not going to go into depth on how to use Gradle or how to use Jenkins in particular, but we're going to talk mostly about what a continuous delivery pipeline would look like and how you can implement some of those steps with uh, uh, Gradle and or Jenkins and uh, just kind of connect the dots, if you will, uh, with how these, uh, these technologies would come together. So first, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Gary Hale. I'm a uh, principal engineer at Gradleware. Uh, what that means is that I spend roughly half of my time working on the Gradle core software. Uh, the other half of my time, I go out doing training and consulting and things that drive revenue for Gradleware and pay everybody's salaries. Um, I say that's roughly half the time, although recently I've been doing a lot more development than, uh, than training, but uh, that's roughly what I do. Uh, at the end of uh, this, uh, this presentation, I'll post these slides up on speaker deck so you can always use them as, uh, as reference or what have you. Uh, before I get going, just to give some credit where it's due. Uh, if you've maybe seen this presentation before at other conferences or seen it uh, listed, this is uh, based on some original content that was done by Ben Mushko, who is a, another great aware engineer. And uh, it's been modified and used with his permission. Now, this is also kind of a very, very condensed form of a workshop that we do at Great Aware, where uh, we actually go through the process of developing a continuous delivery pipeline. It's much more hands-on and such. So. If at the end of this you're uh, interested in uh, maybe learning more about this, that might be some place to, to look. So, I've been doing uh, DevOps work for over 15 years, since long before anybody was calling it DevOps. Uh, I've kind of held a variety of different positions, and I've always been uh, uh, very involved in the release process, and I've been involved in some really, really bad releases. And I think that uh, most people can identify with that to some extent or not. Uh, part of the problem with that, or part of the reason why we consider these releases to be bad is that they're, they can be very painful, right? So, you know, you might expect that you're going to uh, be up all night on, say, a Saturday night trying to get this uh, release of software out. And then you might also be expecting that throughout that week, it's just going to be this baton death march of triaging bug reports and trying to, you know, get in uh, fixes for things that you missed during testing and that sort of thing. And the natural response to this, the, uh, the natural kind of human reaction to this that kind of permeates up to an organizational level is that because they're painful, we don't want to do them very often. And so we start doing things like scheduling quarterly releases and maybe monthly releases, whatever. And we try to do it as, as, as uh, infrequently as possible. And what that ends up doing is creates larger and larger releases and they become more and more painful. And so what's kind of really become a... a, a uh, a recognition within the industry over the past five years, maybe more, is that uh, this really isn't the best way to do it. In fact, actually, the, the, uh, the best way to do it is the opposite, which is to do releases more frequently. And this is where continuous delivery comes, in, comes into play. And you can think about it kind of the way that you would think about, say, a subway or a metro, right? I mean, there are a lot of different ways that we could handle the problem of getting all the different people that ride the subway or the metro from point A to point B every morning, right? One way is, is that we could have one gigantic train that comes around, stops at every stop. It stops at your stop at a particular time in the morning. It stops at your destination at a particular time. And it doesn't matter if that's when you want to actually be at your destination. That's when the train is going to stop there. Um, and if you miss your train in the morning, well, that's a big problem because it could be hours before another train comes around. So it's not a terribly good solution. <clears throat> but they don't handle it that way. The, the way they handle it, though, is that they have a lots of little trains. They, they, they take a lot of little trains and they run them more frequently. So the idea is that instead of having to be at your stop at a particular time in the morning, and uh, if you miss it, it's a problem. If you miss it, it's no big deal because there's another train coming in 10 minutes. And if you uh, uh, have to, uh, or if you, Maybe forget where you're going in the morning and you get off at the wrong stop. That's not a big deal because there's another train coming along in a few minutes. You can get on that and take it to the right stop. That sort of thing. Software is very similar, right? The more frequently we release it, 
the easier it is to deal with variations and problems in the release. So um, it also is easier to handle the amount of complexity that's involved in that release because we're changing a lot little because we're delivering uh, faster and more frequently. Now, there's always the possibility that because we're delivering fast, we could introduce instability into uh, our production environment, but because we're doing it frequently, it's not going to affect us as much as it would if we had long release cycles, right? So if I were to uh, introduce a problem that maybe is not uh, a high priority, but something that is perhaps annoying to the user, if I was on a quarterly, quarterly release cycle, I wouldn't be able to fix that until the next quarter, potentially. Whereas if I'm doing continuous delivery, I'm trying to deliver as frequently as possible, perhaps every other day, every day. Some organizations can do it within hours. Um, it's not that big of a deal. I push it out there, okay, it's wrong, we're gonna fix it, the next release is gonna take care of it in the, you know, in the next day. So let's talk about some kind of core building blocks, some principles of continuous delivery. <clears throat> the first is that every commit can result in a release, right? Now that doesn't mean that every commit can result or would result in a release, but that it can result in a release. So, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the thing is, is that at its most extreme, every commit could potentially be a release, but every time we check something into source control, we're going to push it through our continuous delivery pipeline and validate whether it actually could be a release. If we choose to release it, we can. If not, we're just basically accumulating a, a library of various uh, versions of our application that could potentially be released and then we uh, release the most, uh, most recent one that we want to when we want to. Now, humans are notoriously bad at reliably doing repetitive actions. So when, if we're gonna do this and try to do this as fast and as frequent as possible, we wanna make this reliable, we wanna be able to uh, automate everything that we can. Part and parcel of that is automating tests, right? This is one of the, like, the biggest slowdowns in any software delivery lifecycle, especially if we're doing a lot of manual testing, is that you know, at some point, developers are done with their code, they've checked it in, maybe they've deployed it into an environment, but then they're waiting on a QA uh, department to test and verify that maybe there aren't any regressions in it, that the changes that are supposed to be there are there. The more we can automate that stuff, the more we can move things through our, our uh, continuous delivery pipeline as fast as possible. <clears throat> and lastly, we consider done to mean that something is released. Now this is hard to do on a long uh, delivery uh, uh, or, or long release schedule because uh, we might be working with something like a Kanban board. We're trying to move things across the board. And once we're finished with it from a, uh, uh, from a software development perspective, we've checked it into source control. We've maybe deployed it somewhere. Now we've got to wait on a, a QA team to, uh, to check it. That could be a long life cycle, right? Because you're basically creating queues and uh, priorities uh, might be different between those different queues. And uh, it's hard to say that something is done when, you know, when we have this kind of long life cycle around it. On the other hand, if we're talking about delivering quickly and automating as much of that testing as possible, we can, uh, we're, you know, our release cycle may be only a couple of days, maybe a couple of hours even. And so we can consider something done when it has actually made its way all the way through the, the, uh, uh, the pipeline and into production. And this is a good way of kind of visualizing what a continuous delivery pipeline would be, is an actual pipeline. So we're moving changes to our application through this pipeline on their way into production. And like any pipeline, we're gonna have valves, we're gonna have gauges to let us know, you know, is, some, is, is everything actually flowing properly, right? We want to build quality into our, uh, our life cycle such that when, uh, if we have a commit that comes in that is maybe not as high a quality and it's something that we don't actually want to go to production, we want to be able to stop it in the pipeline at that point in time and not let it go forward. So we're going to establish these automated quality gates within our pipeline to measure this. So let's talk about what this would look like uh, kind of at a high level. So as developers are checking changes into source control, we're going to check, we're going to pull them out and run some compile and unit tests against them. 
Now, compiling and unit tests, so compile being a type of quality check, right? Is this actually code or is it gibberish? Uh, unit tests being another quality check, but the, the, the uh, point of the, this first stage or this first step in our process is to get fast feedback as to whether what we've checked in is actually good code or not. The next step would be to run some integration tests on this. And this is where we would kind of pull together a lot of different things. So unit tests would be checking just kind of little chunks of code you know, at the unit level. Integration, we're starting to bring subsystems together. This might be uh, tests that run against the database. They might test uh, against different submodules, whatever. But these are more long running tests. And the reason why we split this up is that we want as fast a feedback as possible. Integration tests could potentially run in uh, hours or more, uh, depending on what we're actually testing. And we don't want to wait until that point in time to know whether there's something wrong with this commit. Because potentially there's a lot of, uh, uh, if, if there were instability introduced into the code base, that could have a lot of impact on developers and, uh, and the such. So we separate these two out so that our compile and unit tests can run very quickly, give us instant feedback on, on what's in there, and then only if we uh, have a, a stable code base that we move on to integration tests. Another check that we might want to do here is code analysis. So we're going to do static analysis against the code to determine whether, uh, uh, whether the code is of high quality or not, whether we're maybe implementing some bad practices in our code, that sort of thing. A lot of times what you'll see is that um, code analysis would come before integration tests. And again, the reason for that is that it's a much faster feedback cycle. We can run code analysis much faster than we can do integration tests. For the purposes of this discussion, we're just going to do it in this order. But your mileage may vary, right? You may have different ideas about how you want to uh, construct your pipeline. So the next step in the pipeline would be, at this point, we've kind of got something where we said, OK, you know, functionally, it seems like it's probably, probably good. Uh, from a code analysis perspective, from a qual code quality perspective, we think it's good. So we're going to go ahead and package this thing up and make it ready for deployment. At which point we would deploy into an environment. For the purposes of this discussion, we'll say that we have a test environment and we use this test environment for automated acceptance testing. So this is where we would be doing uh, tests, sort of end-to-end -end automated tests against our application using if we were making, maybe doing a web application, we would use something like Selenium, we might use Geb, uh, any number of other uh, uh, tools that are out there for this sort of thing. And we'd be basically testing to see if we've got any regressions in our code, whether you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, changes that we expect to be there are there in this particular package of the application. And then we might introduce an actual manual step in here, which is a user acceptance testing phase. And this is where we would actually put human beings in front of our application, have them test it, have them uh, uh, try it out. Um, now, as opposed to kind of traditional uh, manual uh, testing practices, we would do a lot less testing in this user acceptance test uh, stage than we would in traditional uh, software development life cycles. Here we would only be doing uh, tests, maybe checking the changes that we're, we're trying to get into production uh, with this particular commit. Uh, this might be, you know, I mean, just things like, you know, I expected this, this particular button to be green, now it's supposed to be red. You know, it, you know, has it actually changed the way it's supposed to, that sort of thing. But it's going to be very targeted tests. We're going to have very, uh, a very good idea of what we're going to try to test before we go to production. Now, up to this point, up to acceptance tests, these are all going to be automated, right? So all of this stuff, just by virtue of checking something into source control, we're going to kick off this process. It's going to come all the way down through acceptance tests. At this point, uh, whether we go into user acceptance testing or not, we're going to make a decision. This is going to be a human decision that, hey, yeah, we're, good. we're happy with this set of changes. We might want to make that a release. So we're going to go ahead and go into user acceptance testing. And if it passes that, then we go into production. Again, these would be manual steps. You could fully automate all of this if you wanted to. I mean, user acceptance testing is a little bit tricky because you actually have human beings that have to do something in between there. But if we had... Uh, 
very good uh, confidence in our automated testing, we could leave user acceptance testing out of it altogether and just push it into prod and then do verification, post-production verification if we wanted to. Okay, so we've kind of put together some puzzle pieces here, um, but what, is, what does the overall picture look like? What is the puzzle that we're trying to, trying to do? How do I do this with these technologies? Let's uh, get into that a little bit. So for the purposes of this conversation, we're just gonna talk about a very simple application, uh, browser-based application where you've got a browser that hits uh, an application running in a container, reads and writes from a database, that sort of thing. It's very uh, uh, sophisticated. It's a to-do to list application. There's gonna be three projects that we'll talk about in here. Um, there's a model project, which is really kind of like the, uh, the functional code of this application, a repository project that's going to have uh, the uh, code that access, actually accesses the database and uh, does our, you know, has our data access objects, that sort of thing. And then we'll have a web application that kind of ties around all this stuff uh, and has most of our uh, front end UI. So from a project hierarchy perspective, this is what this would look like in a typical Gradle project. I would have a single high level project called, in this case, to-do, it's just the name of my application. And then I've got sub projects that represent those different modules that are involved in there. So model, repository, and web. I'm gonna have build.gradle files that represent project specific behavior for each of those projects. So this is just gonna be stuff that specifically uh, applies to the model project or the web project. At a higher level, I'm gonna have a build.gradle that maybe injects common configuration amongst all of my different uh, sub-projects, as well as a settings.gradle that binds all of these projects together into a multi-project build within Gradle. And so settings.gradle would look something like this, you know, where we include each of the different uh, projects that are associated with it. And um, um, at that point, I can basically, with Gradle, I can run any or all of the different uh, build tasks within my project from the, uh, from the top level. The other thing to point out here too is the Gradle wrapper, which is uh, a good thing to use. What this does is allows us to couple the version of Gradle with the application itself, with the source code itself. So if I'm turning this over, I'm dumping this into say a continuous integration server, I don't have to worry that because I'm using Gradle 2.3 that that continuous integration server also has to have 2.3. What the wrapper will do for me is it'll say, oh, okay, this project uses 2.3. Well, let me see if you've got 2.3 installed. No, okay, no, you don't. I'll go download it and then make it available, right? The next time you try to run something in continuous integration, he says, oh, you've used 2.3. Let me see if you've got 2.3 installed. Oh, you do already because we installed it last time. I'll just use that and continue on. So this is just a nice way to uh, couple the uh, uh, version of your project uh, with the source code itself, or the version of Gradle with the source code itself. The other thing that we'll do here with this, or typically what we would do with this is we would uh, decompose our build.gradle into multiple kind of subcomponents here, these what we call script plugins. And what this allows us to do is instead of having a large build.gradle, build we uh, have decomposed it into smaller, more manageable chunks. And these are also more reusable. So these particular uh, chunks that we have in here, and we'll mention some of them as we go through uh, our example, these could all be potentially pulled in by any one of these uh, 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 sub project, right? And the th types of things that we might do here, we could pull in versioning strategy, might be one thing that we would decompose into a script plugin, as well as integration and functional test setup. Basically, anything that uh, allows you to kind of modularize your uh, build logic. So when we look at the project from the perspective of the artifacts that get produced, the model and the repository project are gonna produce jars. They're Java code, they produce a jar, and uh, uh, that's their output. On the other hand, the web application produces a war, which is really what represents our application. This is the deployable artifact that we're gonna tag and move through our continuous delivery pipeline because it contains everything. If I wasn't 
uh, talking about a web application, my deployable artifact might be some other type of package. It might be a zip or a tar file or something like that. But the point is, it's the thing that represents the application. It's a thing that I deploy. It's a thing that I'm kind of moving through my uh, pipeline. So let's talk about the, uh, the stages in our build pipeline. So the first stage is what we call the commit stage. And this is kind of pulling together some of those, uh, those puzzle pieces that we talked about before. And here we're going to have things like compiling and unit tests, integration tests, code analysis, um, assembly, as, and finally, we're going to publish any binary. So if we've got something, uh, a commit that has made it through all of these different stages, we're ultimately going to publish that somewhere. And what this stage really does is it's going to assert that our application is good from a technical perspective, right? And we've actually got you know, some sort of uh, version of our application that could potentially be considered for release. At that point, we're going to go into our acceptance stage, and this is where our functional tests would run. Um, at this point, we're going to retrieve those binaries that we've just published. We're, then we're going to deploy them, and then we'll run our functional tests against some particular test environment or something like that. And this is going to assert that our application you know, actually functions at a fully functional level, right? So you know, this is actually going to be running in a container. We're running automated tests against that. Now, if it makes it through this stage, then we've got something that we got to make a decision on. Do we want to move forward with this particular uh, or this particular commit, or maybe you know, it, you know, it's great that it, that, it, that it's good to go, but it's not that important. We're going to wait, you know, until tomorrow to do this release, and maybe additional commits could come through uh, during that time. But if I decide that I do want to move forward with it, I'm going to go into my UAT stage, which is where I'd put it in front of testers and eventually into production. But those two steps would be triggered manually. Now, you notice these yellow arrows that we've got here. What this is really representing is that at the end of that commit stage, I'm publishing a package. And then that package is what I'm moving through the rest of the stages. So in the acceptance stage there, I'm actually retrieving that package out of some sort of uh, repository, whatever it might be, running my tests against it, and checking the box. Uh, similarly, in UAT, I just pull down that same package and keep moving forward. <clears throat> so let's drill down into uh, some of these different steps. So we talked a little bit about compiling unit tests and how we want that to be rapid feedback. Typically, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to see it with my projects less than five minutes, and my unit tests would run in sub-second time or better. Uh, again, your mileage may vary depending on your application. Some applications are really big. You just can't run them in, you know, in less than five minutes. But it's a good rule of thumb. Um, we're going to run these on every, uh, in, in every uh, version control check-in. So every time we check something in the source control, this is going to be the entry point into our pipeline. So this is the first thing it's going to run. It's going to run for every commit. or Well, not necessarily every commit. It could, you could have multiple commits that kind of come in together. But uh, uh, the point is, is that every time I kick off a run of this uh, pipeline or uh, commits moving through the pipeline, it's going to uh, start with my compile and unit tests. And if this is broken, this, this should be a priority for me because what this then means is that there's something pretty drastically wrong with my application and uh, it's probably affecting developers. The next step here with integration tests, this is where I'm going to move any sort of long-running tests. Um, Typically, what you see in here are things like database integration tests, as well as kind of tying submodules together and running integrations that way. And uh, there's typically some sort of environment set up associated with this, right? So uh, if I'm doing database integration tests, well, I have to have a database up and going. I have to have a database to actually test against. Um, you know, and there is some, uh, some setup and maintenance cost uh, associated with that. And we'll talk about what, you know, some of the ways that we can do that. First, let's talk about how we would organize this from the project perspective. Now, I think most of us are probably pretty familiar with the, uh, the Maven-esque source main Java, source main test, source set uh, arrangement. And source main Java is going to be my production Java source code, right? This represents what I'm actually going to deliver and put into production. On the other hand, source test Java represents the 
sources for all of my unit tests. Now, again, I could lump all of my integration tests in there too, but then I'd kind of be going down the path of trying to do them all together and I'd be ruining that fast feedback that I want to get from my unit tests. So what I do is I create another source set here and Gradle makes this very easy where I can create source integ test Java and this represents all of the sources that are associated with running my integration tests. Now, from a, uh, a source code perspective, what this would look like, I can do a source sets integration test. What that's going to do is create a new integration test source set. And then I can set things like the source and resources directory here. Now, Gradle follows a con convention over configuration uh, mantra. So if I put all of my source into source slash integration test slash Java, I wouldn't have to set this. But because I've got it under source integ test Java, but then I'm referring to the source set as integration test, I have to, I have to set this manually. I have to create that linkage there. And so that's the only reason why we've got java.sourcester there as well as the resources. Um, but other things that I would have to configure here too are the compile and runtime class path. So I'm just setting up where it's going to look for those uh, integration test sources. And then I'm also setting up a, a custom test task which this works just like the built-in unit test task, but it's uh, an integration test task, and then I just have to configure it to tell it, okay, well, what classes am I actually going to run for this integration test? And I can also set, out, set up where the uh, results would be uh, posted. So with Gradle, he produces uh, JUnit test reports coming out of, say, a unit test. I can do the same thing with an integration test. I just need to tell it, well, okay, what directory do you put the new reports in? And then to run my integration tests, I would just do uh, Gradle W integration tests. So Gradle W being the wrapper that I was talking about before, um, as opposed to running, say, Gradle in a, uh, uh, in a system uh, installed location, I run Gradle W with integration tests, and that's going to make, make it use the wrapper. So database integration tests. Uh, this is a pattern that we're going to see with a, with a lot of our tests here, is that we have some work that we have to do before and after we uh, run tests against a database. So it's not enough to just fire up my integration tests and go. I actually have to have the database started. And I might be in an environment where maybe the database hasn't already been provisioned, right? So I might want to do things like apply all of my DDL, build up the schema. I might want to seed it with uh, uh, test data. Uh, whatever. But these are things that I want to do before I run my integration test. And then when I'm done, I want to be a good uh, citizen of my server and stop the database when I'm, when I'm through. Now, this database could be anything. It could be a HyperSQL database. It could be MySQL. It might be something more uh, complex. So I'm not going to get into the details of what starting and stopping the database might look like. But let's just assume that we have some tasks that would do that for us. And as far as building the schema, there's a couple of things out there, Liquibase, Flyway. These are two things that are, you see commonly used. What these allow you to do is maintain a change set of changes to your database and couple them in source control with the rest of your application source. And then <clears throat> in that build schema step that I've got there, what I would do is actually use like Liquibase to apply all of those changes to uh, uh, the, uh, the database that I've just started. From a Gradle perspective, uh, we're going to use this pattern, and we're going to see this you know, uh, over and over again in here, is that what I'm going to do is I have to create this dependency relationship here, where integration test depends on starting the database, because it wouldn't make sense to run the integration test if I, if I hadn't started the database already. And then I'm going to finalize the integration test by stopping the database. So integration test depends on start and prepare database would be my task. Integration test finalize by stop database is uh, causes stop database to run after integration test. Now, when I say that it depends on start and prepare database, what that means is that integration test won't run until start and prepare database runs. And if start and prepare database doesn't work, He's never going to start integrations test. He's going to stop the build at that point in time. On the other hand, with the finalized by, what happens is he's saying that, okay, anytime I run integration test, I have to then run stop database. But as opposed to the depends on, if integration test fails, if it is a total disaster, 
and doesn't do anything, I still want to be uh, a good citizen. I want to clean up my mess. And so I want to run stop database. And that's what finalized by is going to do. You can think of it kind of like a Java try finally uh, block where you're always going to run it no matter what happens in between. <clears throat> and as we talked about before, we would want to take that database uh, information or that, that database configuration, how I'm creating start and prepare database, and move that off into a script plugin and uh, uh, modularize my build. Okay. Another thing that I might want to do from a unit uh, and integration testing perspective is use a code coverage tool. And what this is going to do is allow me to uh, take some sort of uh, measurement with regards to how well my tests are actually testing my, uh, my application. Now, you know, this is a little bit of uh, alchemy as much as it is science in that I can tell that a test has actually touched a particular line of code, but I can't always tell whether it's actually doing a good test of that line of code. So, you know, normal, uh, uh, you know, review practices are, are in line here, but, uh, in terms of just being able to tell whether I've actually tested a, you know, a part of code and I've, I've, I've uh, maybe exercised all the different branches, this is what I would use. And there's a couple of different options here. One is Cobertura. I've used this quite a bit. It's not a bad tool. Uh, and this does offline bytecode instrumentation. So what happens here is that I run the, uh, the build or the compile of my test classes, and then I run another step that instruments those test classes. So I'm actually producing new bytecode that is an instrumented form of those test classes. Another popular option here is Emma, which uh, works exactly the same way. Something that works a little bit different is Clover. This is a tool by Atlassian. And what it actually does is source code instrumentation. So it's actually changing my source code prior to compiling it. And then the option that has been kind of incorporated into Gradle is Jococo. And the part of the reason why it was uh, incorporated in there is because of the way it works. And it does on-the-fly bytecode instrumentation. So what happens here is that I compile my test classes, then I run my tests, and during the process of running my tests, he's actually instrumenting the code on the fly. And so this results in no modification to my source or my bytecode. I know that what I'm testing is exactly what, uh, 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 what was coded. So, as I said, this is kind of built into uh, Gradle. We, Jococo is a core plugin. When, once I apply Jococo, I immediately get this Jococo extension on all of the, uh, all the test tasks. So when I say test tasks, I mean tasks of type test. So test, integration test. If I had functional test, I could put it in there too. Um, and then I can configure various information about that uh, for each particular one. And, one of the things that I need to do is actually specify the location of where I want to dump some of the information. Um, but I can do the same thing for integration tests as well. So if you wanted to gather some uh, uh, code coverage on your integration tests, it's as simple as doing some configuration like that. So what this actually does is that when I run test and integration test, it produces these .exec files, which are what I configured up here before. So for each of these uh, uh, test uh, phases, he's going to produce this .exec file. And then I would have to run an additional set of tasks to then take that .exec file and create reports. Now, that report could be an HTML report. It could also be an XML report. Or, or it could be you know, potentially some other format if you, uh, if you wanted to. Um, but if we created an HTML report, what we then get is the semi-graphical representation of what my code coverage looks like you know, for each particular phase, right? So I'd have a set of uh, uh, reports for test. I'd also have a set of reports for integration test. So my next phase would be code analysis. And this is where I'm actually doing static analysis of my code, trying to determine whether it's meeting quality criteria that I've set. This is kind of like an automated health check. I mean, you know, sure, the, uh, the code seems to work. It's passing tests. But is it something, you know, is it just done horribly? Is it something that's maintainable long term? And I want to fail it if it doesn't meet certain quality criteria. Um, 
Another thing that I might want to do here is record this progress over time. So I want to be able to kind of visualize, you know, it is, is my code getting better? Is it getting worse? You know, is my, uh, uh, is the complexity of what I'm doing, is it, is it getting better, is it getting worse, that sort of thing. Now, there's a number of uh, code analysis tools that are available. Uh, there are plugins in Gradle for PMD, FindBugs, CheckStyle. A lot of these have been around for some time. And typically what they do is they uh, hook into the check lifecycle task. So check is a lifecycle task that's built into Gradle, where when we say, okay, Gradle W check, what I'm saying is run all of the tasks that would check my application to see if it's uh, ready to be deployed. So that might be things like testing, integration testing, uh, code analysis, whatever. The other option out there is to use Sonar. And what Sonar does is he actually ties these different uh, tools together and he gathers all this information up and then makes it presentable. Um, so what happens is my Gradle build is running Sonar, uh, the Sonar runner task. This is built into Gradle. Um, it's going to analyze my Gradle project and then publish that information to the Sonar database. And then the Sonar application would be something that I deployed somewhere in my environment. And then I point it at that database and I'm going to get a graphical representation of the changes in my software code quality over time. Um, I'll show and that's what it would look like. Something, you know, depending on your version of Sonar, you might have something different, but it's going to, you know, pull all this stuff together. It's got a lot of different representations, things like heat maps and uh, uh, line charts and the such. By the way, managers love this. They don't know what it means, but they're, you know, mesmerized by all the numbers and the charts and the such. So, you know, it's always a great thing to uh, put in front of your manager, especially when it's really easy to uh, incorporate. But from the perspective of configuring this, um, I would have sonar properties that I set. This might be things like the name of the project. So at a high level perspective, this would be setting the overall to-do project. And then I would set up uh, in, for each sub-project information about those. Um, and I might also have information in here like where the database is, that sort of thing. So. Coming out of code analysis, now at this point, I've kind of run all of my basic checks to determine whether this is a, uh, uh, whether this version of my application might be releasable. Uh, at this point, I want to go ahead and assemble it and create uh, uh, my war archive or my zip archive, whatever it might be. Um, one thing that you know, is important to understand here is that we're going to exclude environmental configuration. We're not going to create environmental, environment specific versions of my war of my uh, uh, zip file or whatever, I'm going to create a single uh, package that I can then just pass around to each environment. And I'm going to externalize that configuration in any number of ways. There's a couple of different ways I could do it. Number one, I could, I could uh, inject it at deployment time somehow. Uh, the other way I could do it is I could actually have a separate uh, set of a separate set of uh, packages that represent each individual environment configuration. Uh, but I'm going to include build information in here too, so I'm going to include things like when this particular package was built, maybe what commit it was built off of, that sort of thing. And this is where my versioning strategy is going to uh, come into play. So if you're familiar with the Maven world, there's a versioning strategy where we say that, okay, well, while we're still developing a version, say 1.0, we're going to append dash snapshot onto it. And what that means is that, okay, this is just a snapshot version. It doesn't represent a release, and this could be changing over time. Once we go into production, we actually change the version from 1.0 snapshot to 1.0, and this symbolizes that it is actually a released version of the product. Um, as far as the continuous delivery pipeline is concerned, this is something that we found to be, you know, uh, maybe a better way to approach this, which is that I include something in the version that represents the commit that I'm actually moving through my pipeline, right? So in this case, and what we're going to talk about here is using the Jenkins build number. So when I first kick off a Jenkins build that represents the beginning of my continuous delivery pipeline, I'm going to assign a build number here that's going to be based off of the Jenkins build number, and that's going to travel with this version of the software all the way through to production. So even when I'm released, it's going to be 1.0.134. Now, from your perspective, it might, you might also include patch versioning in there as well. So it might be 1.0.1.134. 
But the point is, is that somewhere in there is some unique identifier that represents this particular commit that's been moving, th that's moving through my pipeline. So from a, a Gradle perspective, I take all that good versioning goodness, push it off into a script plugin. So again, I'm modularizing it. Um, and then I would apply it to all of my projects, doing an apply from and then versioning.gradle. And that versioning would be, could be something very simple like this. And what this does is that this gives me kind of like a simple kind of convenience class where I can use, I can represent my version both in my development environment as well as in a continuous integration or continuous delivery environment. So what he's going to do is look for a source build number in the, in the uh, uh, process environment. And if it exists, he's going to tack it on to the end of the version. If not, he's just going to continue using 1.0. So if I'm on my uh, uh, works, workstation um, and I try to get my version, I'm always going to get 1.0. If I'm in a continuous delivery environment in one of the servers on its way through, I'm going to get 1.0 dot whatever the build number is. There we go. And then when we package it, we want to include build information in our uh, in our package. So first thing I want to do is create this build info file. And I could put anything that I wanted to in here. Uh, typically, what you would do is put the version, the timestamp that it was built. I like to also put the commit ID in there if I've got that available to me. Could be any, if, any information I wanted to. Might even, you know, the host name that it was built on, whatever. But then what I want to do is include that in the ultimate, ultimately in the application that I'm deploying. And so if I'm deploying a war, this is how I would do that with Gradle. Just say that I'm going to include build info.properties and I'm going to put it into webinf classes. And the nice thing about this, because it's a properties file and I'm putting it into the class path of my web application, is then I could potentially expose it via you know, an admin interface or something like that. So it'd be really easy to look at an environment and determine what version has actually been deployed there. And then the end of that commit stage, once I've assembled everything, I've validated that my application is good, I'm going to go ahead and publish these binaries. I'm going to publish them into some sort of binary repository. Now, this might be something like Artifactory or Nexus. It could be just a flat file system that you use on a shared file system or something like that. There's a number of different ways you could approach it. It all just depends on kind of what your organization uh, uh, uses. Um, but again, like I said before, we're going to publish once and then we're just going to reuse it all over again. What we don't want to do is be constantly building this thing from scratch over and over again because that's just going to slow things down. And it also introduces opportunities for potentially uh, changing the application along the way. Okay, so from a high level, what that would look like, we've got uh, Gradle, which is building this thing. He's producing a 1.0.34 package. He's pushing that into, say, something like Artifactory. And then I've just got this catalog of different versions that have actually made it through the commit stage and have been published into Artifactory. You might also want to have something that does some cleanup here, too, because you know, in the typical life cycle, if you're not doing uh, you know, an extreme continuous delivery thing where you're publishing every uh, possible commit that you know, has made it through the pipeline, you know, you're going to accumulate things over time here, and many of which may are not uh, actually been released. Um, we've also got to uh, think about when we're doing deployments and the such, we've got to maintain some idea of how do we uh, uh, split up configuration amongst different environments and things like that. And this is a uh, configuration that I would use at deployment time. It could also represent configuration that I'm injecting into the application at deployment time as well. So what I'm going to make use of is something called config. Uh, it's built into Groovy called config slurper. And what this allows me to do is kind of define these blocks in here where at the top level, I'm just defining common configuration. So binary repository represents uh, kind of this block of information that is common to all environments. But then from an environment specific perspective, I use the special block environments. And then each block under that represents each environment. So if I'm building for the test environment, I'm going to pass this in when I, uh, when I, when I slurp this configuration. And I'm going to tell it that I'm, I need the test configuration. And it's going to provide all of the common configuration as well as the configuration that's down in this uh, environment's test block. 
And then I'm showing uh, uh, username and passwords in here. Typically, we wouldn't include this in a build script. We would hide this off into uh, another file, something like gradle.properties or potentially uh, you know, your own uh, 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 file that has been appropriately protected you know, from a security perspective. And then during the configuration phase of my build, what's going to happen here is that, um, number one, I'm going to pass in what environment I'm deploying for. So when I run my Gradle command, I'm also going to do a dash P that says set a project property here. I'm going to say ENV is equal to UAT. So what that's going to do is then say, okay, load the configuration and, e and I'm passing in ENV here. So load the configuration for UAT and then get me that parsed configuration. So now what I've got is kind of an object called parsed config here that has all of this information in it. So if I said parsed config dot binary repository dot URL, I would get that string. And then I use an all projects block to basically set this configuration on all of the projects within the build. And so now in any, in any project within the build, I can use that config uh, property to access my configuration. And so if I'm publishing into Maven, what I would do is use that config. So we see that the full repo URL is being built off of config.binaryrepository.name and .url. These are things that I, that I set in that configuration. <clears throat> and I would publish my application into the, uh, uh, the binary repository. At this point, we uh, uh, have made it through our commit stage. We've decided that our application is good. We've pushed it off into a binary repository. And now we want to actually pull stuff out of that repository and start putting it into environments and uh, validating it through functional tests. So the first thing I want to do is ret retrieve those binaries from my uh, uh, binary repository. And so I'm going to request that versioned artifact. And so this would look from a high level something like this, where I've got, uh, you know, this is all washed out. You don't have some of my lines in here, but anyway. Um, so 1.0.34 has been published into Artifactory at the end of the commit stage. Now at the beginning of the acceptance stage, I'm, pu I'm using Gradle to pull it back out. And then I'm going to use Gradle to deploy it into a test environment or a UAT environment or what, whatever. So this is what this would look like. Um, this is one approach to it. There's a number of different ways that you could approach this. But what we're going to do is to declare a dependency on this war that we've already published. But we're basically in the same project. So I can get access to the, pro the project's group, the name, and the version uh, just from my local project. But then I'm going to say I'm actually going to pull this out of this binary repository. And I'm going to dump it into this download dir. And so I use a copy task, and I say from configurations.to do, which represents this, uh, 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 this Maven triplet to the, uh, to the actual published binary. And then I'm going to dump it in the, uh, local, uh, this local directory. And I call my task fetch to do war. Um, if I wanted to run that uh, manually, I would just do great old W fetch to do war. At this point, I want, a deployment. I, I want to deploy this application. Now, I can do this uh, for at least the test environment. I'm going to do that on an automated fashion. I'm going to pull. This is going to be part of that continuous delivery pipeline. But I could potentially do this on request as well. So you know, when we talk about our Jenkins jobs, we'll have a deploy uh, job that basically is just pulling out whatever the, uh, the latest version of this application is. But this makes it a, re a reliable process. <clears throat> so we talked about how our configuration is stored uh, in that config file based on environment, and we're going to pass that environment in on the command line. Um, so if I wanted to deploy to test, I would call my, t my deployment task with dash p env equals test. He's going to go get all of that configuration that represents the test environment, where to deploy it to, what the server is, what the username and password is, that sort of thing, and perform the deployment. The only thing that differs between that and UAT is the fact that I've got a different, uh, uh, I'm specifying a different environment on the command line uh, and potentially using slightly different configuration to do the deployment. 
So one way we could do this is something like cargo to deploy to a Tomcat container. And uh, there's a, a very good uh, cargo plugin available for Gradle. And so <clears throat> the first thing that we would do is download this uh, artifact from the binary repository. So I'm setting up a dependency on that fetch to do war task. So before I deploy it, I want to actually pull it down from the repository. And then I want to undeploy it if it's already out there. So I might have something that tells me whether or not the app context actually is out, uh, is out there. And I might do something like just pinging the, uh, the, the application URL, see if I actually get a successful result. If I do, well, then it's obviously deployed. I want to uh, undeploy it. And then I would use some of that environment specific configuration to, to tell Cargo how to remo uh, deploy this application to the remote server. So this is information that's coming out of that uh, configuration file. Uh, specifically, the, if I were deploying to the test environment, I'm getting the test values for server.hostname, server.username, et cetera. And so to do a deployment there, I'm specifying the environment on the command line and then the cargo deploy task. At this point, I want to actually run all my functional tests. And this is going to test the UI permutations of my application, do automated regression testing, that sort of thing. Um, and it could potentially run against different environments. So I, you know, in our example, we were just talking about doing this against a test environment. I could potentially have more environments that I could have a test environment and a performance environment and, uh, and potentially others. And so much like our database uh, integration tests, we have a similar problem with our functional tests in that we have to know that the application is actually out there first before we run the uh, functional test. Um, now, there's a couple of different ways that we want to do functional tests, right? So on the one hand, we want to be able to run tests locally to determine whether they actually work or not. So on the developer workstation, I want to be able to run it. But I don't, I'm not actually deploying it locally. What I want to do is uh, fire up a version of Jetty from Gradle <coughs> that is going to then host my application, then I run my functional tests, and then stop it. And so what this would look like is something like this. So I've defined a task called functional test that points to all my functional test classes. And then I set up Jetty run and Jetty stop actions, and I'm following the same pattern that we talked about before, which is that it depends on uh, well, first of all, it depends on uh, Jetty run depends on the functional test classes actually being uh, compiled first. But then the functional test depends on Jetty run being started. And then the functional test is finalized by the Jetty stop task. Talk through all that. On the other hand, I might want to run remote functional tests. And this is where this comes into play in my continuous delivery pipeline, where there's the local test where I'm basically testing it on my local workstation. Then there's the functional test where I'm running it against the uh, deployed application out on the test environment or something like that. And so this would be very similar, but I'm just going to define another functional test task, test, you know, this task remote functional test. And this looks almost exactly like my local test, except that um, I'm setting different properties here around where it's going to actually run the test against. And I may extract some of the commonality between those two tasks into uh, a, a common set of configuration here. So I've set an extension property here for uh, functional test report dir, functional test results dir, that sort of thing. And I'm just going to reuse that information across both of those tasks, both my local functional tests as well as my remote functional test. And to run that, at this point, I have to specify what environment I'm actually going to deploy to. So I say P, in, or not deploy to, but a test against. So environment is equal to test, and then remote functional test to run against that remote environment. And we can take this as far as we want to. So we can do capacity performance testing here. Any other type of testing that we might want to have uh, occur in a, uh, uh, in a remote environment. OK, so up till this point, we've been talking about um, just Gradle and how to do some of these steps with Gradle.
Now I want to start talking about how do we take Jenkins and coordinate all of this with it. Because Gradle is just kind of giving you the nuts and bolts. This is how you do each step. We want Jenkins to actually coordinate all that together into a pipeline. So what we want to do is model our pipeline as a series of jobs. So we talked about some of these different steps and uh, stages. So the first stage is to do initial. This is where I'm going to trigger uh, my job off of SCM. So Jenkins is constantly looking at my SCM repository. When he sees a change, he says, ah, I've got a commit here that I can push through the pipeline. And he starts it on its way. And so the first thing he's going to do is actually run those unit tests, do that first stage that we talked about in the uh, commit stage, or that first step, I should say. Now, I'm going to use the build name setter plugin here. And what this does is it's going to um, set a unique name for this particular build, right? And so we're going to call this particular run to do number 74. And we're going to keep passing that through to all the different stages in this pipeline. So this is being assigned initially via the, the, the uh, initial uh, job, but then it's going to be passed down through all the other jobs so that we're all talking about the same thing as it flows through the pipeline. Uh, we talked about using Jococo, uh, and this is true of basically any of those other uh, 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 code coverage tools as well, is that I can suck all this stuff up into Jenkins and display it as well. Uh, but via the Jococo plugin, I would do that. And then I'm going to use the parameterized trigger plugin. And what this allows me to do is and say, say that, okay, after I've run my initial uh, build, which is I've noticed something that's changed in source control, I've run my compile and unit test, now I want to kick it off, kick off the uh, integration test. This allows me to kick that off and then pass down that information about what do I call this build? It's to do number 74. I'm going to pass that in as I go along. So I'll use, in all of my steps, I'm going to use the Gradle plugin uh, for Jenkins. And what this allows me to do is gives me kind of like a nice, uh, nice way of, of configuring my Gradle uh, builds without having to use, say, a, just a shell, uh, shell script or something like that. So I'm always going to use the Gradle wrapper, as we talked about. And in that initial uh, stage, I'm always going to use clean as well. So what clean does is actually kind of takes the build back to zero. It removes all of the uh, incremental stuff that comes with, uh, with Gradle and uh, ensures that I'm starting at a clean slate um, when I start my, start my pipeline. So <clears throat> this is how that build name setter would be configured. So again, if I want to call it to do number 76, what I'm doing is that in the configuration for the, the build name setter, what I'm doing is setting to do number build number. And this is a, going to be the Jenkins environment variable uh, coming out of that. But this could be any information that I wanted to. If I had some other way of assigning a unique ID to this thing, again, it might be something as simple as the commit ID or something like that. Uh, I could set it to whatever I want it to. But the point is I'm setting it here and then passing it down through the rest of the stages of my pipeline. Parameterized trigger plugin. This is how I'm moving in between different jobs within Jenkins. So I started with to do initial. Now I'm going to go to to do integ test. And so what, I'm, what I've done is on to do initial, I'm setting up this parameterized trigger to say kick off to do integ test, only run it when the build is stable, and then set up, set this. Uh, parameter on the build that I'm starting up. So this is how I'm passing that build number down to the uh, next stage in my pipeline. The other thing that I want to do is I don't want to keep building over and over and over again. So I built it once when I, uh, or I built my application once when I did my unit tests or when I ran my unit tests. So now what I want to do is just pass all of that goodness along to the next stage so that I'm not doing it again. And I can make use of the incremental capabilities of Gradle. And so I use this clone workspace SEM plugin to do that. And what this says is, okay, I'm basically taking the entire workspace, packaging it up, and then I'm going to pass it around as I go from stage to stage. But I only want to do this if the build actually succeeded. If it didn't succeed, then I'm never going to use it in any other part of my pipeline anyway, so just throw it away. <clears throat> 
Jococo plugin. I've got to tell it where to put the or where the separate test result or the separated test results are. I also have to point it to where the class files are, that sort of thing. And then for my automated quality gates, I can put information in here about what I think is a, uh, you know, an appropriate level of coverage. So in this case, if the branch coverage is under 70%, I'm gonna fail this particular step in the job and it breaks off the, the pipeline. So we're never gonna get past this particular job in our delivery pipeline. Okay, so that's looking at it from the perspective of just like the to-do initial. As we move on to, into jobs that are further down the pipeline, this is how we would reuse that workspace. So again, I'm using this clone workspace plugin. What this allows me to do then is say, okay, when I start uh, to do integration, go get me the, the uh, zipped up workspace from to do initial and make that my starting workspace. So he's not pulling things out of SEM, he's pulling things out of the previous job. I'm also using build name setter plugin to now set the build name in this job, but I'm setting it to what I passed in from the previous job. So when I set that build number to number 74, now I'm pulling 74 out. I'm calling this particular build to do number 74, and I'm referring it to it consistently across the jobs in my pipeline. Lastly, I'm gonna use the build pipeline plugin. And what this allows me to do is number one, uh, it allows me to <clears throat> uh, visualize my pipeline. I'm going to show you an example of that. It also allows me to do things like manually executing uh, my next step. So remember we said that UAT and production would be manual deployments. Um, this is how we would do it. So we wouldn't kick this off uh, automatically at the end of the last job, which would probably be my functional test job, but we would kick it off only if a user comes in and says, okay, this particular uh, release, I want to actually put it into the UAT environment and uh, start testing it. And so we would configure this via the uh, build pipeline plugin and it's this manually execute downstream project. Um, notice also when we are talking about passing in the environment on the command line, this is how we would do it is with the switches for uh, the, the Grail plugin. And then with build pipeline, I get this visualization of my pipeline. So these are the different stages of my thing. You can't really read this, unfortunately, but we've got the initial stage, which is compiling and unit tests. Then I've got integration tests. And then I've got, uh, what's next here? Yeah, code quality, then performance tests, or deployment into test. So code quality, deploy, uh, I can't read that. <laughs> Yeah. So from left to right, we've got initial, then in TED tests, then code quality, then uh, uh, packaging up the distribution, then deploying into test, and then I'm running functional and performance tests in parallel. And then these last two are actually the manual steps, deploy to UAT and then deploy to production. Um, and notice a little uh, icon in the lower right hand corner of this guy here. This is where somebody could just come in and with one click deploy that into the unit or the user acceptance testing environment. And then yeah, after it's been in there, we go and deploy it into the production environment. This is one commit that's kind of made its way through. Here's another commit that sort of made its way through and then blew up halfway along the way. So we can kind of visualize commits that didn't make it through the pipeline. And then this is one, this is one that's on its way through but hasn't completed yet. Okay, so that's the end of the uh, presentation. If uh, you've got any questions, I'll be happy to field them now. Okay, so uh, that's it, guys. I'm done. Thank you.